Hi there, and welcome to the lecture um, on the Southern Song Dynasty for a survey of Chinese art. The Southern Song starts in 1126, 1127 at the fall of the Northern Song, or what becomes known as the Northern Song. Last time we looked at the Emperor Wei Tsung, who was the last emperor of the Northern Song. And remember, he ruled for the first quarter of the 12th century, and because he was focused so much on aesthetic concerns and especially on art and calligraphy, uh, he didn't pay much attention to statecraft. And so the Jurchen, also known as the, the Mongols, are able to come in from the, the northwest and conquer the Song Dynasty and send the remnants of the court fleeing to the south. Wei Tsung actually um, died in captivity um, and then another member of the same family, the same royal family, took over and became the emperor of the Southern Song. They moved to a more southern location in China, which is why they get the name the Southern Song. And the landscape around where uh, um, Hangzhou, where the Song is, uh, the Southern Song is located, is this kind of lowland, uh, lots of lakes, lots of uh, kind of misty, you know, low rolling hills, uh, and that seems to be a major influence on the art of the Southern Song. We're going to look at a few painters of the Southern Song. This dynasty lasts about 150 years, and during this time, the, the, the Southern Song, it's smaller than the, North had, the Northern Song had been, it's less powerful, and there's always this kind of sense that, um, you know, things of this world are fleeting. They seem to have been really psychologically influenced by the fall of the Northern Song Dynasty, and that really plays into the kind of art and the kind of paintings that are popular in the Southern Song, especially at court. At court, there are a couple of kinds of painting that we see um, that we'll be looking at here in this lecture. First among those is this kind of landscape painting. I had mentioned last time that one of the things we see is a shift in format, so that we see the um, predominance of much smaller scale paintings in the Southern Song, much more kind of tightly focused, very delicate, very personal, very intimate format of the album leaf or the fan. In this case, this is a fan painting that originally would have had a, um, a strut or handle uh, that would have clamped onto the middle of this fan that's been mounted now onto um, an album page so that it could be put in a little box and then you could take it out and hold it. These, these are usually very small, not much bigger than your computer screen usually. In fact, sometimes much smaller than that. So they're, they're fairly um, small, intimate format paintings. And this is by the, one of the leading painters of the Southern Song, Ma Yuan who is from a family of painters, the Ma family of painters. Um, as you may know, by the way, I don't know if I've even mentioned this, that um, typically in China the last name or the family name is first and then the individual um, given name is second. So Ma Yuan, um, Ma is his family name. This is uh, probably mo his most famous painting and it's very typical of the kind of style and subject that we see in the Southern Song. Ma Yuan viewing plum blossoms by moonlight. Uh, of the Southern Song Dynasty. A couple of things to note here. First of all, it is a landscape painting, but if you think back to the Northern Song landscapes of guys like Fan Quan, remember how there were people in those landscapes, but they're dwarfed by these gigantic, enormous mountains? Um, this is a much more human-scaled kind of painting, where the, the scholar and his servant there in the left-hand corner of the painting are fairly, you know, large comparatively, especially if you think back to the monumental landscapes of earlier. Um, and this really is indicative of a shift in the mindset of the Southern Song, where the Northern Song was all about the kind of majesty of empire and the cosmos and the order of things. Um, that had crumbled for the Southern Song. They had seen their dynasty really vulnerable, and what emerges is a much kind of more um, lyrical and melancholy almost um, emphasis on the idea of the fleetingness of life and the some of the themes that you see a lot in these um, paintings are themes like plum blossoms, orchids, um, the moonrise, you know, uh, fog burning off in the early morning sun, stuff that is indicative of transience. Orchids only bloom for a couple of days and then they, they stop. Plum blossoms um, I believe these are the ones that only come out at night in the moonlight, you know, and then they fold up during the day. So, and autumn is a very popular theme in the Southern Song. All of these 
natural metaphors for the idea of transience and fleetingness of life and, and you know, momentary beauty. So it's a very different kind of landscape painting, uh, not only in the size and, uh, and in the, the scale of human beings, but also in the subject matter that you often see. And so here is one of these melancholy, bittersweet, you know, the fleetingness of life, Mayuan, viewing plum blossoms by moonlight. And here again, you've got that solitary plum branch coming out. Um, the plum blossoms open up in the in the evening under the moonlight and then they'll, they'll close up again before dawn. Here he is watching this transient moment of beauty out by himself um, contemplating nature. Now another thing to note is that and this is this is what Ma Yuan becomes known for is what is called the one corner composition where most of the detail and most of the composition itself is really concentrated in one of the lower corners of the painting and usually with Mayuan it's in the lower left hand corner where you have a developed picture and then a lot of the silk in this case is left blank right so that you have this vast kind of undefined expanse of sky so that's um and in fact Mayuan was so known for this device, for this compositional device that he got the nickname One Corner Ma. Uh, and this became a model for other painters of the Southern Sung. So for the, the rest of the time of the Southern Sung, this one corner composition uh, following Ma Yuan is a very popular kind of composition. And it's very, very, very heavily associated with the Southern Sung. Here's a nice close-up of the scholar, as you can see. Um, here again, I mean, some things haven't changed. We've got this, the artist is using calligraphic brush strokes, uh, varying densities of ink, varying dry or wet brush, uh, and then ink washes in the background built up with layer upon layer of ink uh, in order to create different textures and the sense of some things being in the foreground, some things being in the background. So all of those kind of things like atmospheric perspective that had been worked out by the landscape theorists of the Northern Sung are still being used here, but they are being used in a different kind of smaller format of painting. Here's another one of his famous paintings, Ma Yuan's um, On a Mountain Path in Spring. On a Mountain Path in Spring. As you can see here, it's again a one corner composition where most of the detail, most of the action is taking place on the lower left. And here, um, notice that what he's doing is the typical kind of thing that you might even think of, you might even think of um, with the Northern Song or, or the Wei Song, excuse me, I had a little senior moment there, um, where he's out observing closely details of nature. You've got b birds, right, flying, and one sit pit perched on a branch. He also has with him, um, trundling along behind him, in the very left-hand corner is a servant who is carrying a rolled-up hanging scroll and a, a stand for the hanging scroll so that the scholar is going to stop at a particular point when the mood strikes him, and he's going to have his servant set up this painting so that he can sit and look at a painting of a landscape and then sit and look and contemplate the landscape itself. And here again you've got the one corner composition and you've got the varying um, densities of ink and the fading out of the ink wash to create a sense of um, nearness and distance and in a landscape that can be unlike those Northern Song monumental landscapes these landscapes can be taken off or, or taken in all in one go. You can sit and look at it and see the whole scene. So it's a much more human scaled, um, human scaled sort of um, um, image. The inscription is also by Ma Yuan, and it is a little couplet, a little poem that is talking about the fleetingness and beauty of life. I'm going to read it to you here, so you can you can kind of get a sense of the melancholy mood of these pictures. Brushed by his sleeves, wild flowers dance in the wind. Fleeing from him, the hidden birds cut short their song. So here, right, you can see, and that's what's going on in the painting. There are the scholar's long sleeves brush the wildflowers as he's walking down the mountain path. He has startled the bird, and so the bird that was sitting on the branch has taken off and is flying away, right? And that, again, evocative of the idea that life is short, it's beautiful, it's transient, it, you have to live in the moment because these things pass so quickly.
And there's a nice close-up of the scholar. And again, I like this because here you can see the ink wash under his feet to create a sense of a, a ground underneath his feet. And notice that it's darker and more detailed here in the foreground, and then it fades in the background. Uh, same thing with these wildflowers. The ones that are closer to us are more um, dense um, pigment-wise, and then they kind of fade off in the background behind the, the scholar, the solitary scholar. Here's Mayuan Scholar by a Waterfall, and again, all the same things that I have been saying still apply here. So Scholar by a Waterfall is uh, just signed, Your Servitor Ma Yuan, so we know that it was given to um, an emperor or another important person in the, um, in the court. And here is again one corner Ma with him, or the scholar and his servant, out on a solitary walk in nature. Uh, looking at a waterfall, again, you've got the the details concentrated in the lower left corner, kind of fading out on the diagonal, um, so that on the right-hand side there's really um, nothing but a little faint ink wash. And it is another sort of subject of being out alone in nature, um, appreciating beauty, um, and the solitary kind of contemplative life that is the ideal life of a scholar. The other really kind of influential painter from early on in the Song Dynasty is this man, Sha Gui. This is his mountain market and clearing mist. And as you can see, I mean, this isn't quite exactly the same as um, Ma Yuan, but it's a similar kind of idea where you have this very misty landscape. It's very small scale. This is an album leaf. It is um, a few concentrated details here in the foreground here kind of aligned along a diagonal so you've got the left top corner of the composition left mostly um, mostly empty. Uh, if Ma Yuan was known as one corner Ma, Sha Gui was known as half composition Sha. So between the two of these guys, Sha Gui and, um, and um, Ma Yuan, you have a style, a Southern Song style that develops that gets the name the Ma Sha School. The Ma Sha School, which is the kind of style that you see in the Southern Song for landscape painting. These misty compositions, small, kind of tightly focused, where a good deal of the painting is left, is left uh, blank. And here's another Sha Gui, pure and remote... Uh, pure and remote views of mountains and streams. This is just a detail of a very long hand scroll, and I believe I've got a um, link to the whole hand scroll that you can see in, um, in um, whatchamacallit, in, uh, yeah, Blackboard. So, let's see. Uh, Sha Gui uses the same kind of brush strokes that we saw developed in the north, the axe cut, the devil's, um, devil's face um, texture, rocks, the crab claw trees, but then again is using them to, pre to present much smaller, more intimate landscapes where you have half of the composition often left quite blank and quite empty and quite open. Here are some views of Sha Gui's um, pure and remote views of mountains and streams. So you can see that he's developed this along this whole hand scroll. So you have areas that, like here on the top of this section of the hand scroll, you've got um, one half of this view that is highly developed. And then it sort of fades off into these very misty, low-lying mountains, which really does reflect the look of the southern part of China, by the way. So Ma Sha, oh, and there's a couple of views of the Li River in southern China. So you can see that this is what Sha Gui had been looking at when he develops the, um, the painting pure and remote views of mountains and streams. Yeah, so there's a couple more views of Sha Gui's hand scroll. And again, this is combining some of the textures and calligraphic brushstrokes of northern Song painting with this much more intimate focus of southern Song landscape painting. And then again, with the use of these asymmetrical compositions. Half composition, Sha, and one corner, Ma. And here are a couple more views. And then these are some karst formations in southern China that reflect the um, kind of landscape that he would have been looking at, that Sha Gui would have been looking at in order to create that painting. 
and then this is the final the final um, section of that hand scroll that I'm just kind of scrolling through for you. Okay, so this style, this very empty asymmetrical compositional style that has this very intimate connotation and very melancholy or bittersweet feeling of the, the fleetingness of life, uh, th this is something that continues. Here we have um, a painter named Ma Lin. He is related to Ma Yuan. He's actually Ma Yuan's son, one of Ma Yuan's sons. He's also a court painter. Uh, and here, this is the style of formal realism that we saw really popular in the Northern Song court of, um, of, of Wei Tsung, Emperor Wei Tsung, that continues into the Southern Song. And here it's boiled down to even a more kind of abstracted and asymmetrical, um, very formally meticulous composition. It's a very self-conscious composition, conscious composition. It's not meant to be just, you know, here's some um, orchids that I've seen and so I'm going to paint them. Uh, and this is signed only with the signature Ma Lin. It is a, a painting done for a court member. And very aesthetic, you know, very kind of consciously or self-consciously aesthetic, arranged into a very careful pattern. Orchids, as I said, a popular subject, especially in the Southern Song, because they are beautiful and delicate, and they bloom for a very short time, and then they're gone. Some orchids only bloom for like a day, you know, so they're, they're very, they're emblematic of the idea of the, the sweet and fleeting beauty of life. Here's another of Ma's paintings, Ma Lin, who again, son of Ma Yuan, takes after that Ma Sha school. This is a um, painting called Layers and Layers of Icy Thin Silk. Now, this is a, um, uh, icy silk is actually a kind of silk that was produced for the imperial family that was spun very, very fine and woven very fine so that it was um, see-through practically, okay? Very gauzy, very delicate, very lightweight, very expensive silk. Obviously, that's not what these are. They are actually meant to be um, uh, plum blossoms, okay? So, and again, plum blossoms associated with this idea of the fleetingness and beauty of life. Uh, Ma Lin created the picture, and as you can see, it takes some of that idea of um, formal super realism and makes this into a very self-consciously, purposefully arranged, very spare, very elegant, very empty in most of the, of the silk uh, composition. So it's self-consciously sort of aestheticizing. This was inscribed with a poem by one of the emperor's consorts, one of his many wives. Let me read you the, why, the, the poem that you can see there inscribed across the top. So this is a kind of courtly composition that was a um, collaboration between an imperial consort and an imperial painter. Uh, so the poem is translated like this. Like a chilled butterfly resting in the corolla, embracing the rouge heart, remembering former fragrance. Blossoming to the tip of the cold branch, it is most lovable. This must be the makeup that adorned the Han Palace. So in the poem, which I know is a little bit abstract sounding, um, here the, the poem is saying this is, you know, like a chilled butterfly. Imagine a chilled butterfly resting in the, the blossom of the flower, embracing the rouge heart of the flower, remembering its former fragrance. Okay, if a flower is chilled, if a butterfly is chilled, these are things that are dying. These are things that are on their way out. Blossoming to the tip of the cold branch, it is most lovable. Um, you know, this is a beautiful, fleeting, evanescent thing. And this, I, this must be the makeup that adorned the Han Palace, is actually comparing these beautiful, delicate, fleeting, gorgeous plum blossoms to women, uh, imperial consorts in the Han Palace. The Han Dynasty, remember this is the um, dynasty that's from about 200 BC to 200 AD. That is the kind of ancient Rome for the Chinese. And so they would often look back to the Han as this period of great glory. And in fact, the Chinese um, ethnically call themselves the Han people. So they look back to this ancient period as a, another kind of golden age of 
the the Chinese people and the beauties of the Han Palace. And in fact, that becomes a really popular Southern Song story or Southern Song subject is um, imperial beauties in the Han Palace. Uh, and in fact, that'll be popular in later painting as well, as we'll see. Anyway, so this poem comparing the fleeting beauty of these chilled, delicate plum blossoms, this very elegant spare composition um, that's all about beauty and fleetingness, just like the butterfly, just like the, um, the beauty of the young woman in the Han court. <laughs> 